All right, we're going to do an overview of the digestive system. So we've done a, a coronal section of the skull. So we can take the skull and we can separate it from the cervical vertebrae like this. Let's see if we can prop that up. Uh, so just to give a, a quick idea of what we actually separated here, uh, you can see that here's the base of the skull. Here is the forium and magnum here. And we've cut a wedge of the occipital bone out of this area. And on either side of the forium and magnum, we have these saddles here. These are called the occipital condyles. So those saddles sat down in these receptacles here and here. Those are the superior articulating facets for the atlas which is C1. So we separated this joint between here and those occipital condyles we just saw. Um, and that's going to be the atlanto-occipital joint. So separate those two things. We can still see the spinal cord sticking out here. Uh, and another thing you can see in this area is if we reach around and we grab the transverse processes of the atlas here, you can see that we can take those transverse processes and turn them like this. And that is showing you the joint between the atlas and the axis, which is the atlanto-axial joint that we can kind of show here. So that joint is most of your movement side to side, doing lateral rotation of the skull is going to be for that joint between C1 and C2. And the joint we separated here in those occipital condyles we showed is going to be most of the movement uh, for your skull to do flexion and extension will be in that uh, first joint there, which is the atlanto-occipital joint. So that was some of the stuff we separated there. Now, we've lifted off all of the throat structures are now off of the cervical vertebrae that we see here. So up in this area, you can see we made an incision here. Just grab that, kind of open this up here. And what we're opening when we do this is the pharynx. So this is the very back of your throat, right in this area there. Okay, so here we're going to open up the back wall of your throat here. So we're opening up into the, the pharynx along here. And first thing we see is the soft palate up here, which is this flap that I'm moving up and down. And if we follow the soft palate out to the end, we see this little point that I'm holding up there, just kind of outline it like that. That's going to be the uvula. And if we move inferiorly from there, then we have this cartilage flap that I'm moving down here. That's going to be the epiglottis. You can see if we push it down all the way, whoops, if we push it down all the way, it will cover over that opening there, which is the attitus. And if I push down through the attitus here, I'm going down into the larynx. So we had seen this on the anterior side where you would have found the laryngeal prominence or the Adam's apple. So we're just opposite of that here. We're on the posterior side of the thyroid cartilage right along there. And if we go around the thyroid cartilage, we can come down, 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 and right here, right where I have the forceps there, that's going to be the end of the thyroid cartilage. And that is where the pharynx is also going to end. So from this point down, going down into here, we would start calling this area that I cut open the esophagus and not the pharynx. So moving back up, we can see that this whole region here, the pharynx, is divided into three parts. Um, and basically you want to remember that the pharynx is behind everything else in your throat. So it's named, the regions of the pharynx are named for what part are they uh, posterior to. So if we come up here, if I, if I have the forceps up in this area on top of the soft palate, here I'm in the back of the nasal cavity. So we're going to call this region right here the nasopharynx. And then if we go from the end of the soft palate, where we saw the uvula, from there to the epiglottis, so in this region right here where I'm moving the forceps back and forth, we're going to, that spot is in the very back of the mouth. So we'll call that the oropharynx. And then from the epiglottis all the way down, down, down until we get to the edge, the uh, inferior uh, border of the thyroid cartilage, so from here down to there, we're in the part of the pharynx that's located behind the larynx. So we call this the laryngopharynx. And again, once we extend past the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage, then when we continue on down in here, we just call it esophagus. And roughly, 
this spot where we kind of transition from the pharynx to the esophagus is about where the musculature in this area goes from being voluntary to down here more involuntary. So if we move down into the thoracic cavity, we can, we're gonna move the pericardium here, we're gonna remove the heart, and we can see along the posterior uh, side of the pericardial sac that we can kind of pinch right here and lift up this fleshy tube there, and that'll be where the esophagus continues down in the thoracic cavity. So maybe if I just, you can kind of see it now located behind the pericardium. Uh, so it's the most, the esophagus is gonna be the most posterior thing we have in the thoracic cavity. It's laying right against the bodies of the thoracic vertebrae. And then as the esophagus comes down, it's gonna go through the diaphragm right here. And at that point, the esophagus essentially ends and, and the stomach is gonna begin. So we're gonna reposition down a little further so that we can get into the abdominal cavity and then we'll pick up on the digestive system. So, down here you can see that we've removed all the skin and the fat from the anterior uh, abdominal wall. We have left, as a landmark here, the umbilicus. Uh, we need to know where this is. So I've made some incisions here so we can open up into the abdominal cavity. And notice that the incision I made along the midline here is just on the left side of the linea alba. So again, we're maintaining the umbilicus and we're cutting on the left side of it. And that's to preserve the internal portion of your umbilical cord, which is still present going from the umbilicus over towards the liver here. That's why you don't want to cut in this area. So we made this incision and then we go from the umbilicus over towards the anterior superior iliac spine on both sides. So we end up with three flaps that we can open up here in the abdomen. So we're going to take these and just reflect them over like this here and then this one is not going to want to stay because we have a little bit of an issue with the bladder but um, we'll kind of hold this down as best we can here let's see maybe we can tuck a little bit of the towel on here hold that down there we go that's good uh, now uh, I'm going to hook up some bungee cords which are going to open up our field of view here a little bit make it easier for us to see stuff Get one hooked up right here. Like that. That's good. And we'll hook up one on the other side here. So let's just kind of reposition stuff in here so it all looks the way it's supposed to look. Like that. There. All right. So when we first open up the abdominal cavity, you notice that we have a large blanket of fatty tissue here that hangs over the inferior portion of the abdominal cavity. And this fatty tissue here is going to be called greater omentum. If we follow that greater omentum up, we see we run into this organ in this area here, which is your stomach. And notice how the omentum does not cover the stomach. Uh, and the greater omentum is going to come up and it's going to touch the greater curve of the stomach, which is what we see right here. And then if we go up a little farther, and we're going to take this and just move it up out of the way here for a second. And we see a little bit more of that fatty tissue right in this area here. And that's going to be lesser omentum. And the lesser omentum is going to come down and it's going to meet up with the lesser curvature of the stomach. So greater omentum meets the greater curve. Lesser omentum meets the lesser curve. None of the omentum covers over the anterior portion of the stomach. So we can see the stomach uncovered there. Uh, other things we can see in this area, you're looking at the bottom of the liver here. And then notice under the right lobe of the liver here is where we have this green sac there that's going to be the gallbladder. Here, I'll kind of just reposition this a little bit. We have a flap right here. and see if I can get my finger underneath like that. So you see we have this thin 
membrane here, and all the way at the end of the membrane, right in here, there's a tube right there. And that is the remnant of your umbilical vein. And if we follow that out, all the way up, 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 it's going to lead us right back right in along here towards the umbilicus. So this was the point of entry for fetal blood, was to come down through the umbilicus, through the umbilical vein, all the way down, and we can see where that would have entered into the liver right there. That would have been the first point of entry for fetal circulation. The rest of that membrane of which that remnant umbilical vein is embedded in, this back here is called the falciform ligament. That's a suspensory ligament which is going to hold the liver up against the diaphragm. So we can see that there. Another thing we can see is if we reach in to the thoracic cavity, and we're just going to push up from the diaphragm here, we're going to lift up that organ there, and that's going to be your spleen. So that's located in the upper left-hand portion of the abdominal cavity. And as soon as I let that go, that's going to fall back down, way back up in there behind the stomach. So in order to see it, you, have to, you just have to lift it up from the thoracic cavity. So that's a spleen there. And without repositioning anything else, we won't be able to see any other parts of the abdominal cavity. So you see the omentums, you see the stomach, you can see the bottom of the liver, gallbladder, spleen, and that's pretty much it. Um, so let's continue on with the digestive system. So we left off, we saw the um, esophagus on the posterior portion of the thoracic cavity, and we said as it comes through the diaphragm, then it's going to um, turn into the stomach. Now, if you look way up in here, and the lighting's probably not good, but way up in this region up here is where the stomach's going to get, uh, or I'm sorry, the esophagus starts to get wider, and we call that part of it the cardiac region of the stomach. Um, and then the portion of the stomach that we're seeing here is when it's at its widest. That's going to be the body of the stomach. And then we can see that the stomach is pinching down, becoming a bit narrower in this region here, and that's going to be called the pyloric region of the stomach. So once we go through the diaphragm again, we got cardiac region of the stomach, body of the stomach, pyloric region of the stomach. Now we're just going to slide the stomach over just a touch here like that. And right here, there is a large muscular lump right in that area there. And that's going to be called the pyloric sphincter. That's going to mark the end point of the stomach, beginning of the small intestine. So if we just shift this over even a little bit further, I'm just going to hold the pyloric sphincter over like that. So my finger is right on the pyloric sphincter. And then from this part that we see hooking down this way, that's the first part of the first part of the small intestines. So this is going to be the duodenum, and this part of the duodenum here is called descending duodenum. It drops down on the right-hand side. Now, can you see where we stop seeing that here? Okay. So notice how the duodenum looks like it disappears in this area, and that's because the duodenum is going to go through the peritoneum and become retroperitoneal. So everything we're going to see in this video right now are all peritoneal structures. Everything that's contained within the parietal peritoneum, which we can see lining the abdominal wall here, and the visceral peritoneum, which is lining the organs and the omentum and everything else we're going to see down here. Um, we're looking at stuff that's contained within the peritoneum. But there are also some structures that go through the peritoneum and are located behind the peritoneum. The duodenum is one of those things. We see the beginning part there. When we saw it go through the peritoneum, it becomes retroperitoneal. It's behind it. And then we're going to look now to see where the duodenum enters back into the peritoneal cavity. So in order to see that, we're going to take the greater omentum and we're going to reflect it. So we take this, we're going to reflect the greater omentum up like that. And notice that once we do that, we can see adhered to the underside of the greater omentum as part of your large intestine. This is the transverse colon that we can see there. And then also notice that attached to the transverse colon, we have some other fatty tissue down here, which is much uh, more uniform and smooth, as opposed to the, if I just bring this down here, the omentum is globular, and this stuff down here, which is mesentery, is smooth. And that's how you're going to tell the difference between those two things. Mesentery is always going to be smooth yellow. Omentum is going to be globular yellow. All right, so we'll bring this back up. So we got that transverse colon, greater omentum reflected. Now we can see the small intestines down in this area. So let's just reposition the small intestines a bit because they're a little twisted up. Just 
get everything to hang nicely here. Kind of like that. That's kind of how your small intestines would, would hang. So what I want you to see is that what we're looking at here are the second two parts. Let me do it this way. What we have here are the second two parts of the small intestine. Largely what's down and to the left in this area is going to be jejunum and most of this over here which is down to the right is going to be ileum. So we're going to take all of this and we're going to move it over towards the right hand side this way like that. So all the small intestines we're going to mobilize them as much as we can over towards the right. And then in this area right here we have the duodenum re-emerging so we can kind of see I'm just going to push through the peritoneum here. So you see I'm under the peritoneum. This is where I'm sticking the forceps now is retroperitoneal. And that's where the duodenum is emerging from. From the retroperitoneal space comes out. And we see that it's coming back up at us here. And that, that's going to be ascending duodenum. So we saw descending duodenum. Here's ascending. What we're missing is in this area going down that way is horizontal duodenum. And we'll see that next time. Right here... Notice that if I grab this loop of intestine here and I try to pull it down, it's stuck right along there. This is called a flexure. And that flexures are areas where the intestines are anchored to the abdominal wall. And you can see that we can fold this spot and it folds right along here. Okay? And that flexure right there where it folds is going to mark a name change where we have the end of the duodenum here, which again was ascending duodenum to the second part of the small intestine, which is jejunum. And that's the definitive spot right there where you're going to say duodenum ends, jejunum begins. So let's take all the small intestines and put them back down to where we had it before, like this. Now, in this area, there's not going to be any way on the outside for us to tell, are we looking at the jejunum or are we looking at the ileum? Because outwardly, they are going to look the same. So there's no line in the sand that you can draw in this area to say definitively that's where the duodenum, or I'm sorry, that's where the jejunum ends and that's where the ileum begins. You're not going to be able to see that. Only way you're going to know for sure if you're dealing with the jejunum or the ileum is to be at the very beginning of the jejunum, which we just saw, or to move everything and be at the very end of the ileum, which is the next spot we want to find. So we're going to take all the small intestines and now we're going to move them over to the left hand side. And we're going to expose this area here. Like that. Now, right here is the very end of the ileum. So this is the end of the small intestines. I know for sure since I'm at the end that I'm on the ileum. And right here is where the ileum, and I'll just put this down for a second, is going to join this larger thing here, which is going to be the large intestine. So we have the end of the small intestine, beginning of the large intestine here. Notice how they kind of make a T right here. At that spot where the ileum joins the large intestine, we're going to have another sphincter in this area. It's not nearly as big as the pyloric sphincter. Um, this one's called the ileocecal sphincter, and that's naming the two things that's going to separate, the ileum, the ileal part, and the cecum, cecal part. All right? so ileocecal sphincter would be located right there. So if I hold this up, we can see that the small intestine does not join the very beginning of the large intestine. Uh, instead, it joins in a couple inches up from the beginning of the large intestine. So we say that where the ileum joins, right there, from there down, this pocket of the large intestine that hangs down is called the cecum. And from where the ileum joins here, going superiorly, this way, is going to be ascending colon. So we just have a little name change there, and you're going to mark that name change right where the ileum comes in. So ileum down, cecum, ileum up, ascending colon. In this spot here, and I'm just going to flip this a little bit, hanging off the bottom of the cecum, we should see the appendix. And it would be right here coming down this way. Now, it looks like this appendix has been removed, and this area is has some scar tissue on it, so it, it may have been uh, cauterized in, in this area after they cut it off. Or this could be coincidental, and, and it's something else. But my guess is that the appendix was right here, and that this is a, a removed appendix. If we move up now, we can see ascending colon continuing up along the right posterior abdominal wall. And again, we had already seen up here that we said that this is transverse colon. So we want to see that if I try to pull up on the transverse colon, that it's stuck 
down here. And that's going to be another flexor. So the large intestine is pinned to the posterior abdominal wall right in this area. And we're going to call that the hepatic flexure because the liver is located on the upper uh, right hand side of the uh, abdominal cavity. So anything liver related is going to be hepatic. So we're going to name this flexure here the hepatic flexure. We follow that up and around and all of this here is going to be transverse colon and then we're going to take all the small intestines and we're going to move them back over to the right hand side take all this stuff remobilize it over this way and you may have to just like come up and look down a little bit because the picture of the descending colon isn't quite as good it's covered up by a lot of fat but here we have that uh, transverse colon go down and way back up in here the large intestine is pinned to the posterior abdominal wall. Again, we're going to say on this side, that flexure is called the splenic flexure because the spleen is in the upper left-hand portion of the abdominal cavity. And then underneath some of this fat, maybe if I go like this, we can see a bit of the descending colon coming down here. And all these little, these little fatty lumps hanging off of the large intestine there. Those are called epiploic appendices. And that's one of the ways you can tell you're looking at a large intestine because they'll have the epiploic appendices where the small intestine, if we kind of bring this over here, take a loop of the small intestine, we see we don't have those epiploic appendices there. Okay. Now, we come down a little bit and I'm just gonna hold this over and we see that we have another direction change here. So descending colon coming down here and then it turns more medially, and that's where we start calling it sigmoid colon. So we're going to have another flexure here, a sigmoidal flexure there. Mark's name changed to sigmoid colon. And then we can see her sigmoid colon continuing deeper into the pelvis here. Now she has a relatively short sigmoid colon. Sometimes we could grab the sigmoid colon here and we'd be able to stretch this loop up into the abdomen a bit. So just note that her sigmoid colon is, is very short. Now, leading us down, we can see there's a little bit of fluid. Can, can we see that there? Kind of. With the fluid? Yeah. Not really? You know what? Let's just wait one second. We are going to get rid of some of this fluid. That's better. All right, now we can see down in this area. And we see the sigmoid colon dropping down towards that pelvic floor down here. And then right in this area is where it stops going posteriorly. And right here starts going inferiorly. And that's where we're going to stop calling it sigmoid colon and start calling it the rectum down there. And then we'd be able to follow that down a bit further. And then where you can't see, once you lose the rectum there, uh, we would have two more sphincters. You'd have the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. Uh, and then that would mark the end of the digestive system there. Now, what we're missing in this area here is the uterus and the ovaries. Um, she's had a total hysterectomy. Everything's been removed. So we would see right here the uterus would be sticking up at us like, like that. It would be about three fingers wide and it would be coming up in this area right here. And we would see the ovaries would be over on the side over here. So in this area and over in this area is where we would see the ovaries and they are removed as well. Uh, okay, next thing we can see here is if we look up at this, the bottom of the abdominal cavity here, you can see this, I'm going to kind of trace around it here, this large raised up portion coming up through here. That's going to be the bladder. Now her bladder is very hardened. I'm not sure of what the cause of that is yet, but uh, it does make it so that you can see it pretty well there. So let's see a couple of the other spots where we, we can't actually um, see these retroperitoneal structures, but I do want to show you where you would find them. So since we have the small intestines all the way over to the right-hand side in here, we can see that there's a bit of fatty tissue down in this area 
there. Now, peritoneum is still covering here, but if we peeled through the peritoneum, we went through this fatty tissue here, we would see the left kidney in this area. So it's covered by a renal fat pad, which you're seeing there, which is also covered by peritoneum. Um, so next time when we open this up, you'll see the kidneys exposed over on this side. And if we take all the small intestines and move them back over to the left, and we look down in this area here, this is where we're gonna see the kidney on the right hand side, back in this area. Again, it's located behind the peritoneum and under that fat. Um, next thing, which would also be retroperitoneal, is gonna be the pancreas. So in order to see that, we take all the small intestine, just kinda get that all back the way it's supposed to be here, and we're gonna take the greater momentum and we're gonna put that back into place, get us right back to our starting position here. And what we're gonna do is just lift up on the liver a little bit. And remember here, lifting up there, that is that lesser momentum. And notice how right here, the lesser momentum's kind of clear, and we can see a little bit of whitish, marbleized tissue showing through there. That's gonna be the pancreas, so it's located right behind the lesser momentum there. And if you wanna visualize how the pancreas is running, what we do is we find the pyloric sphincter, we go just past it so we're down on top of the duodenum here, right at the very beginning of the descending duodenum. The head of the pancreas is r attached and wrapped around the inferior, or the, I'm sorry, the posterior portion of the uh, descending duodenum there. So that's where the head of the pancreas is, which again is what we're seeing right here. And the tail of the pancreas is gonna point, oops, is gonna point this way over towards, remember where we had the spleen. All right, so we go right from the beginning of the duodenum over to the spleen, and that's gonna give you the trajectory of the pancreas going over that way. So this time, next time when we look in here, that'll be exposed. All right, and that is the overview of the digestive system. Again, next time we will have the peritoneum cut, and uh, we will be able to see all of the structures behind there.